Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. After, and, or sorry, and round about the throne were four and twenty elders, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay, we've just passed on uh, another portion of the scriptures, and uh, as the Bible often does, especially in Revelation, to indicate the chronology of it all, he says statements like this, after this, after this, well after what? Well we just heard the list of the uh, Revelation churches and the different messages to them, but if you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And this, I believe, is what he was referring to, the, the, the action that took place, which points to the after this that comes in Revelation chapter 4. It is the writing to the churches specifically. And as you break down the Bible and, and what he's talking about here and, and the command here to preach Revelation, you find there's three things that are mentioned that he was to write. The things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So if you were to look from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12, I believe these are the things which thou hast seen that are being referred to here. Okay, it says in verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Remember, these are the things which thou hast seen that he's been charged to write. The first is the voice. The next is the seven golden candlesticks. In verse 13, it says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. I won't go through all these, but the point is, is that he is writing the things which he has seen. Verse 13 says the Son of God, or one that's like unto the Son of Man. The difference, I believe, is that he is now gold, girt with a golden girdle. In verse 14 it says that the Son of Man, or like unto the Son of Man, which is the Son of God, has his head with white wool uh, hair, has eyes as a flame of fire. Verse 15 talks about his feet as brass. It talks about in verse 16, the seven stars in his hand and the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. Down in verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he lay his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And so what I believe would have astonished the disciple John here, the apostle, is the fact that he's like unto the Jesus that he had known. He, 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 he resembles him very much so, but there's a difference here because this same apostle rests his, his head upon Jesus' bosom, and now when he sees the likeness of the same risen Savior, 
He falls at his feet as dead. He can't even bear the visage of what he has saw. It's so terrible that it literally, it's as it were, he had died at the feet of Christ. And he had to lift him up. Jesus had to lift him up and say, Fear not, I am the first, I am the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He's saying, I, I'm Jesus. You have to recognize me. But the difference was, again, the white hair. The difference was now he's got the golden girdle, feet as brass, eyes as fire. The, the terrible visage that was before John was, was like Jesus, but it was different. So something had changed, of course. And he reminds him what has changed. He's like, I live. I was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. I'm resurrected. Things are different now. So these are the things which he has seen. And it continues on and, and, and says, and the command was to see the things which, um, which are. So he says, write the things which thou hast seen, write the things which are. And the things which were or are, are to him at that present time, I believe, was the writing to the churches. He's writing to present churches at that present time, the things which are presently happening in and amongst them. All those churches which are in Asia, as it says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, and he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto these seven churches which are in Asia. And we know that as we read through it, we saw the different messages to those present day, the things which are, in John's context, the things which are right now is what he was recording. And it was the messages unto these churches where they're at. To understand where they're at and to repent from where they're at or continue on in the things that they are presently at. So again, he's writing the things which he has seen, the things which are. And I believe at the beginning of chapter 4 and verse 1, he starts to get into the hereafter. Now, it doesn't happen right away because he's going to record a few more things that he has seen first because uh, the, the title of the message here is Before the Throne, Before the Throne. So before he starts to reveal the things that are going to be in the future, he's again going to record what he sees before the throne of God. And that's indicated by verse 1 when it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice begins to speak. And what it says is, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And there's that key word. We can grab it from Revelation chapter 1. The hereafter, I believe, is going to begin after a little bit more revelation of what he sees in the Spirit. Now, this is a, this is a, a close... Uh, portion of scripture for me. This, this is one that has a lot of significance in my life. It's actually in the first independent Baptist church that I was ever in. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. I was doing a study on the, on the different, uh, the different uh, types in the, in the Old Testament as far as the feasts and the offerings go and how they apply to uh, us now, how they apply to prophecy and those sort of things. And I came to a portion as I was just kind of reading through this man's book and using it as an outline. It worked really great for that. But if you know, when you get to the feast, they start to, like the, um, sorry, the, the offerings of the Old Testament talk about Jesus' first coming. The feasts of the Old Testament talk about his second coming. And so as I came to the passage of Scripture where the man says, well, this is the rapture, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. I, I couldn't help myself in, in my own conscience to preach it just as it was presented in the book, but I also knew that I was in a situation where that was the general belief of the church. So, so my thinking way was that I was going to present both cases and then everyone can kind of uh, just stick on believing in their pre-tribulation rapture anyways. I wasn't going to get into all the hard doctrines and everything like that. I was just going to explain why my feelings differed from the feelings of what the man presented in this book. I had done it a hundred times before as I went through the study, but this one was kind of the one that eventually, you know, I, I, was, I was removed from preaching Sunday school to the adults every Sunday, 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 Sunday. That, that stopped pretty much like halfway through my teaching. Um, you know, a, a lot of things were different that way at that time. I was only allowed to continue being the song leader, I believe, because I was the only one that was, was really able to. So um, this portion, I'm just going to go on and explain why. Why, I, again, I never got that chance way back when. But, but this is what I would have explained and why this couldn't possibly be the rapture. And the first point that I want to grab a hold of as we read through verse 1 and verse 2, because this is what they say is the rapture. Look at the statement. After this, okay, and you men can just, just say this, the next word. After this, what's that? I, right? Looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first was, and the first voice, which, what is it? 
I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately who? I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So the first thing that I grab a hold of out of this context is that it is one guy. It is John who is looking, it is John who is hearing, and it is John who is going up, right? There is a singularity in the statement being made. I, 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 okay? The next is that there is a door opened in heaven, the Bible says. There is a door was opened in heaven, and that's where the voice comes out of, okay? Through this door. And it says that of this voice, it says a voice as it were a trumpet, okay? So this is a likeness. This is a similitude. This is, this is not saying that the voice was a trumpet. The sound was a trumpet. It is a likeness. And as much as we read about many likenesses of, right? We just read about Jesus being like unto the Son of Man. He was different. He, he was the same. It was the same Jesus. But there was a difference. And the difference was, I used to be able to hug him, and now he's so terrifying, I'm falling down his dead, right? There's a difference. There's a likeness there. And it says, the final point is that it was in the Spirit, okay? He said, I was in the Spirit, immediately there in verse 2. So these points, I can work backwards through them. In the Spirit, do we not believe in a resurrection of the body? Do we not believe that when the rapture comes, we will be united with our body? Well, I do. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Keep your finger there in chapter 4 of Revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a famous rapture verse. <clears throat> All would agree. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, the Bible says, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, okay? So our corruptible body, that if, you're, if you've been there for a hundred years, is most likely just dust, right, at that time. That corruptible, that, that breakdown body, the body that decomposes when it finally hits that dirt, right, when you die, that is the body that it says will be resurrected and will be what? Changed made incorruptible. Just as he beheld Jesus and saw there was a difference in him, we will have that same thing. That is like unto Brother Jimmy. That is like unto Brother Josh. But it's different. It's been changed. Something is new. Now we believe it's a resurrected body. We believe in the bodily resurrection of all the saints. And so when the statement is made in Revelation that he was immediately in the Spirit, there's automatically a conflict between the rapture and this statement made in Revelation chapter 4. We also remember that when Jesus was dealing with Thomas immediately after his resurrection, he took meat. Yeah, he could pass through walls, right? There's a difference there. There's a change that was made there. But he went to Thomas and said, See, behold, touch the print on my hands. T touch the wound in my side. Behold, it is me. And they were able to touch, embrace, hold, high five even Jesus at that time because he was bodily resurrected. He wasn't in the spirit. He wasn't some spook. He wasn't some, some um, just kind of a, a vacuumed presence that you could, you could walk through and you could never behold it. No, it's a bodily resurrection. The next thing I believe is that it's a voice uh, as it were a trumpet. Like I said, that's different than the voice of the trumpet. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says in verse 52, In a moment in the twinkling of eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. An actual trumpet here is sounding. It's not like unto a trumpet. It's not a voice like unto a trumpet. It is an actual trumpet that is being voiced, that is being sounded here. Okay, the next is that um, they say in uh, Revelation chapter 4, it says that a door was opened in heaven. So why couldn't this be? Well, because Jesus Christ is not meeting us or, or calling us through a door. Look, if you would, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. 
where the Bible records, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Now we could say that all oh, that door was in the clouds, okay, sure. But it's clear here that he is coming with clouds. If you were to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, another famous rapture verse. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in verse 16, it clarifies this a little bit. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. There's that same trumpet that's sounding. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, which is the same thing that 1 Corinthians 15 taught. It said that we would not proceed. We would not go before those that are dead. But verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So this isn't the same thing that's being described in Revelation chapter 4 where it says a door was opened and someone was called up through the door. Rather, Jesus is coming here in this picture of the rapture, in this, in this image of the rapture, coming down out of heaven into the clouds, the trumpet sounds, and he catches up the dead first, then we which are alive and remain get caught up together with him in those same clouds. It's a different event clearly that is happening. And the event that we believe the rapture to be is one of everybody. And that's the last point. They'll say, I, I, I is actually just referring to many believers. John here is a type of all the Christian believers throughout all time. They're all of the ones that are alive and remain until the coming of the day. But that just, that just simply can't be. This is one guy. It's not the great multitude that we know of uh, meeting Christ there. It's not the dead in Christ. It's not those that are alive. It's not a, a multitude of many people. It's I looked and I heard and I was in the spirit. This is just a special event for a singular guy. And why they would take that from Revelation chapter 4 and said, this one man pictures the type of many men, all believers, right? is beyond me because I could just willy-nilly take that same logic and apply it anywhere if that's the case. If I can just say, oh, that man means every man. That, that man is a type of all people being raised up. You know, they're being called by a voice as it were a trumpet. And then he's bringing him up through the door. And then that's the rapture of the church. Well then, let's just turn it down and go to the end of verse 2. Where the Bible says, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Okay, well then, that's just a picture of many gods sitting on the throne. Right? I can just take that logic and just throw it anywhere I want, however I want. If they're going to say that I is just, is just John, though he's a picture of actually many people in the church, well then why isn't that just one sitting on the throne, many gods? Hundreds of gods. Thou, maybe it's a multitude of every god that's ever existed that's sitting on this throne, that the many people. You can't just take this and apply it any way you were. And this is the greatest problem that I find with people when they break down the book of Revelation. Yeah, it does say in Revelation chapter 1 that he sent and signified the image here. He, he sent and signified the word of God that it would be revealed unto the specific man as he put it out, right? I sent and signified the message unto the angel, to his servant John. But they'll say that, oh, because it's signified, it's a sign, it's an image. Everything that you read is spiritual, but that just opens them up to their own interpretation. I just did the same thing, and I said, well, then there's many gods sitting on the throne. And I can go down any kind of crazy rabbit trail I, trail I feel like with the book of Revelation, or we can do what the Bible says, and when it comes to you with something that is a sign, a symbol, a signification, then you either do one or two things with it. You just read it plain faced as it is recorded in scriptures and believe it completely literally, or you go out and you make some kind of lame brain excuse about what you think that would be and conjure up an imagination. Or what I do is first make it literal in the primary sense every time, unless Jesus does something different with it. How many times you read in the, in the, in the passages of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, does Jesus actually say, behold, I show you a parable? Right? He's going to explain something that is a picture of a heavenly thing through imagery. And that helps us to understand things. If God is going to use a symbol of something, if, 
If that I, it's John being lifted up, is going to be the rapture of all church people throughout all ages, then God would say so in the same context. Just as he did in Revelation 1 verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Wow, that is a mystery. I don't even know what those things are. I was just reading through this, and maybe it's this, and maybe it's that, and the seven golden candlesticks are these cities, and then and then the, the stars are actually all of these world leaders, and this is they're going to all collapse and fight each other in the last days. And I can go off these crazy tangents, or I can read the rest of the verse. It says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Pretty plain, okay? And that's how God works when he's going to give us symbology. He's going to give us types. He's going to give us parables of things. He will right away, in the context, give you what that parable means. Yeah, there's some things in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah that are a little confusing to us. We have to go to, you know, Book of Revelation, or we need to go to Daniel and try to, try to give more light to these things. And some of those symbols and signs are a little bit harder to comprehend, but I don't believe this one to be the case. And this is the book of Revelation. This is to be the clearest book. This is to be Jesus revealing himself to all of us. So don't go and just make up whatever we can about these things and preach it as a doctrine, as 99% of Baptist churches have, and 99% of evangelical churches have. They've said, oh, this is John going up in the rapture. No, it's not. It's just John going up into heaven to hear the revelation of the things which must be hereafter. <laughs> That's simple. It's very plain. We don't, we don't need a theological seminary degrees to figure out something like that. We can just read the scriptures. Now while we're there, I can also point out the fact that one sitting on a throne isn't the oneness God. Okay, this isn't, this isn't just one God, and, and, it, and it's Jesus, and then it's the Holy Spirit, and, then, and they're all just shape-shifting, but it's always going to be the same presence. And you can see that very clearly if you just look over in 3 and verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. Okay, Je Jesus is... God, okay? These three are one. So if one are sitting on the throne, well, do you know what is sitting in the throne? These three. It's, they're one. They're sitting in the throne. That's not astonishingly difficult, but they'll take that verse and just say, see, there's one on the throne. Just one throne, just one sitting on it. There's your oneness, God. It's a lie. I don't feel like I have to waste my time with that too often because these guys are just, just idiots grasping at straws, okay? But the, but the teaching that comes from, from the pre-trip camp that this is the rapture is it's it's so easily ju just thrown out and honestly that's probably why when i was teaching sunday school i was stopped so suddenly was because if i would have just put the two teachings beside anyone can go oh well, yeah obviously obviously this is not the rapture that that's clear and so and so uh hit the pop hit hit the stop button and, and get this guy out of the pulpit we can't just pick and choose when we're going to take something and make a sign out of it. That's all I'm saying. We can't. We got to let God decide. God will tell you. God will show you. So here's what I believe is happening here. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, it indicates for the first time, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So John here, he's out in the Isle of Patmos. He's having a great time in the Lord. He's, he's in the Spirit, and then a vision starts. And this vision concludes, this heavenly vision concludes with him being charged to write the things which he has seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So he went up to heaven, I believe, when he, became, when he came into the Spirit, and then that's, that's where he resided. This is where the vision came. This is where the things that he saw took place, and, and, and he beheld Jesus from afar, okay? Now, one of two things happened. Either he came down down to earth. He wrote these, these next two chapters and then, and then sent them out. I don't know how he would, from a deserted island, get, get you know, a, a carrier pigeon to send these notes. Or another thing happened, and what I believe is potentially he was he, he remained in the second heaven, right? So we have our, our firmament, our atmosphere that planes and birds fly in. Then we have the atmosphere, which is called the second heaven, I believe, which would be kind of like outer space. And then we have what I believe happened here is after he recorded the vision, in Revelation chapter 4 it says, Behold, 
behold, a door was opened in heaven. This was him seeing from the second heaven up to the third heaven, which is beyond our space. A door, perhaps spiritual, I don't know how it all works. I, I, it opened, and the voice came out of a trumpet that said, come up hither. So he was invited first to the second heaven, then up to the third heaven. And that third heaven is where God resides. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Paul reveals. He says, I was caught up whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot know. And he even told the, pic the story as if it was somebody else because he was so confusing about it. He said he saw things which cannot be uttered. But I believe that some of the things which Paul would have uttered had he had he been given the, the Spirit, um, the Spirit given liberty to, I believe that some of those things John is now going to write. By the command of God, write those things which thou hast seen. And here he invites him up to the throne room of God. And that's the exact thing that we see that happens is he said, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So either way, whether we believe that he went up to heaven, then he came back down, wrote the books, and then now he's being invited up to the throne room of God, or whether he was invited up to heaven for part of his vision and then eventually went up. Either way, we're now in the throne room of God, okay? We are now in, we are now before the throne. And when he steps before this throne, he's going to begin to have the revelation of what shall be hereafter. And it's not coming from necessarily the one sitting upon the throne, but from the first voice which he hears. Okay? So verse 3 says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So the jasper that he sees, if you were to go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 11, the jasper... Revelation 21 and verse 11. It says, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Okay, so this is describing New Jerusalem when it comes down. And what he sees is that the glory of God is upon her, and when he looks upon it, it's as it were a jasper stone, and it's clear as crystal, okay? So verse 18, if you were to continue on, it says, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all matter of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. And it continues on to list the different foundations. So the interesting thing that we see is that the first foundation of the New Jerusalem is made of jasper. The walls thereof are made of jasper. And jasper is something in, in image and in light, right, is like a most precious stone. And it is indicative of the glory of God. Okay, so the entirety of the New Jerusalem looks like the glory of God. It's as a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and that's the foundation, and that's also the walls. Now, my best I can come up with, and a lot of this thing gets a little, um, it's a study in and of itself, but the best I can understand is that is that jasper is a brown or yellow or reddish stone, and quite often it's many colors, and it can be speckled with these different things, but it also comes in green. It's also likened unto the type of the chalcedony stone, okay? And you can go and study all these things. But one thing I noticed was that was that it's kind of different colors. It's kind of different appearances. It, 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 kind, of, it kind of comes in different ways, shapes, and forms. In the same way, I think the glory of God tends to come and, and approach people and deal with people and work in people's lives in different types of ways, different shapes, different tones, different colors. That's how the glory of God I believe, I believe works, right? Sometimes the glory of God knocks people dead on the ground. Sometimes it lifts them up and encourages and strengthens them. The next thing that we see is uh, the sardine stone. The sardine stone. I won't take you there, but if you were to go back to Exodus chapter 28, verse 17, it talks about the sardine stone or the sardia stone as being the first listed. And if you were to write in the Hebrew, you'd go from right to left. Like we often do everything backwards, right? When we're writing, we go left to right. But it would it basically shows that that sardine stone, which is a red color, but not super bright, more like a, a rusty type of red in appearance is actually the one that was closest to the priest's heart on that breastplate, okay? So that red appearance was the one that was nearest to the heart 
And uh, and the and the picture of that, who knows? I mean, you can go and you can study these things if the cows come home. But but it actually, interestingly enough, sits opposite. The, if the ja or if the sardine was here, the jasper, though it's the foundation of heavenly Jerusalem, actually ends down here. And that also could just be a picture of the fact that hey, when we're writing in the Hebrew, we're going through. They represent the tribes. They represent different colors. We're going through it. If we were to just read through it, well, New Jerusalem and the glory of God and the visage of it and the foundation of it, the walls of it and the glory of God, it comes at the end of the book, doesn't it? <laughs> That's when we finally get the full revelation of it all. But it all begins with that jasper or with that sardine that is red it begins next to the heart of God God maybe just leading you from here down through the different colors down through the different stones until you reach New Jerusalem perhaps that's the picture of the thing but the next thing that you notice is that he sees um, in verse 3 there was a rainbow this is interesting round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald okay when we see rainbows and Amanda was just driving the other day and Caleb was the first to notice it we get too busy in our lives don't we we just kind of we just kind of lose lose sight of the the beauty that this world has and, and Caleb actually was in the back and she was talking to me and he was like rainbow 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 probably took him like three or four or five times and then finally she's like whoa a rainbow like and he noticed it first and it was very it was very sweet and a precious moment because because he had noticed and, and it was such a rainbow that went from one side of the sky unto the other made that big full arc and uh, and the violet the purple was very bright in it quite often that's one of the colors that gets a little bit washed out you don't you don't see it in its full clearness but this was this was the full spectrum and it was the full sky and it and it took a toddler to point it out and to give us the opportunity to pause and to enjoy it she was even looking around and wondering if anybody else around there even even noticed it but uh, you know it praise praise from the voice of a child right that's what God loves but this is an interesting rainbow because it said in sight like unto an emerald and we know emerald to be green right maybe that water bottle would kind of be the color of the green emerald there but that emerald is the rainbow and that's that's an interesting thing well what I what I kind of grabbed from this is is uh, and we again we could go and we could go all kinds of rabbit trails there's not a lot of information about what the colors of the and the different types of stones mean in regard to the priesthood and the tribes and honestly if you start studying this stuff out you're like you're like two internet searches away from like Hebrew roots garbage because this is it all comes back to like lore and myths. I think a lot of this stuff is interesting for us to grab a hold of and study in the context of scriptures, right? Anytime we go a little bit further than that, we're going to get to some weird things. But it's it was an interesting study, and and, and uh, what I want to take from this right at this moment, in my understanding of things, and you know, God will eventually open up more things to me. Uh, colors in the Bible would be just an interesting study, right? <clears throat> What I want to grab a hold of, though, is that this is a picture of the visage of God. And I think that this is something that could be very important to us when we're at a time where we believe that the Antichrist shall come and we'll see that man of sin first, the son of perdition, before any, any kind of hope of a rapture would come. We'll actually see him. There will be a great falling away. That man of sin will be revealed. But perhaps he comes in a visage that doesn't look like this. And this will just be another tell that we have. So we have the jasper, which is brown and yellow or reddish and can sometimes be green and speckled. We have the red rust of the sardine stone, and then we have the green emerald rainbow, and that's the visage of God. And everything that I see here, they're all natural tones. They're all earth tones, right? You don't see the neons. You don't see, you don't see the... Um, the the ultraviolets you don't see any of these kind of bright unnatural tones that you don't see too often they're very you know just walking in a forest you'll see the browns the yellows the reddish the green the the rust color the the, the emerald you'll see all of these tones just walking around in your average forest but they're but the neons the, the almost the man-made colors are just missing from this so perhaps Perhaps, you know, we see, the, we see the rainbow over top of him, but it's one that's simply just emerald. What, what does that mean? I don't know. But, but perhaps 
Perhaps the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to have that homo rainbow over top of him, right? There's going to be a difference because, look, he's here and, the, and, and he's got the rainbow over him and the whole world's going to be crying after this man. He is Jesus. He's the return of Christ. And we're going to look at that rainbow that's over top of him and it's not like the sight of emerald. Maybe that's going to be something that just kind of cures us and just, just cues us to the fact that there, there's something off here, right? There's something different here. So that, that's what I see from this, is that, that these colors of God are, are very natural, and they're very, they're very warm to us. Like they're, they're something that we would just, we would just love and as, as humans, but more so as Christians. Whereas, whereas, whereas some people tend to get withdrawn from those, those colorfuls, and we, want, we, we would want like the brights, the shinies, the neons. You know? You know, maybe, maybe Antichrist is going to come, and he's going to look like you know, a, a, a workout person in the 90s, and just have like neon everywhere kind of thing. Who knows? But but that's one thing that I noticed is that this is showing us a, a, a variant or, or a visage that we could we could use to cue, cue us to understand, hey, this is Christ or this this isn't Christ when that day comes. In verse 4 it says, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So we have here twenty-four seats. We have 24 elders, and that indicates to me that they all have a place. The, the, the seats were mentioned, and the seats were there first, okay? So this was something that was appointed, something that was, was set. There's no empty seats. There's no, there's no uh, extra seats. There, there, there's no one standing. There's the exact amount of seats that were needed, and they're all there, and they're all present. And these 24 elders are sitting on them. They had a place. They had an appointment. It was their purpose to be there, whether it was from the foundation of the world or something that was appointed at a different time. I know not. But they're all there. They, they could be heads of the tribes of Israel. They could be then followed by heads of the disciples, you know, the 12 originals minus Judas, and then whoever replaced them, the Apostle Paul. I don't know what he saw, but he saw these, and what, what you see about them is that they were ones of prominence, okay? Because there were specifically 12 crowns given unto the each of, or 24 crowns rather, given unto the elders that were there. Uh, the next thing that you see about them is that they are in white raiment. They are clothed in white raiment. Go with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Get a picture of white raiment and how it would be pictured in the Christian's life. We know that it says in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8 that the fine linen, clean and white, the fine linen is the righteousness of saints Early on in the book of Revelation, Jesus talks about giving white raiment unto those that have overcome, unto those that have believed. And if you go to Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. So we do have these 24 elders sitting on 24 seats by divine appointment with 24 crowns of promise, prominence upon their head in the white raiment that they are holding. But I believe that these would be no different than you and I. And their white raiment came by means of verse 4. For after that, the kindness and love of our God or Savior toward man appeared. So just as you and I are, just as you and I are, were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts. It's the same way that these men, I believe, at one point stood. And yet now, here they stand and they sit in the prominent place before God with the crowns upon their heads because the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared unto them. In the same way that we will stand before God, it says in verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I think I said it last week that even if we have white raiment, I'm wearing a white shirt you get close enough and you're going to find it's not so white and yet God here gives to these elders and God here will give unto each and every one of us who've believed by faith not by works have received the mercy of God and been regenerated and renewed by the Holy Ghost we will have a clean and white and fresh robe to place on us we will have a clean and white and fresh garment to put upon our skins 
Verse 6 says, Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there you are justified, even as these were by his grace, made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So according to the faith that you've put in God to receive by believing eternal life, and that gift has come unto you and made you an heir, something you weren't deserving. I believe these elders sit before God in the same way. But what would the difference then be about these elders toward everybody else? Why do they have this place of prominence? Well, I believe that these were ones that, according to verse 8, or similar to verse 8, says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So the difference, perhaps, of these, that they're sitting in that place where there's a seat made for them. They're sitting in a prominent place before the throne of God with the crowns upon their head. And prominence among the people of God is because these might be ones that were careful to maintain good works. And these good works are profitable unto men Yes, ourselves, because look, these guys got a position of, of authority, a position that is, is higher stature among other people. But also, these were good works that are profitable unto other men. In 2 John verse 1, or chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And how do we receive a full reward? As it's described here, it says, be careful to maintain good works. Yes, we're saved not by works of righteousness. Yes, we're saved by the mercy of God. We're saved by receiving that gift. The cleanliness comes from Him alone. But those that are saved ought to be careful to maintain good works. And who knows, some of those 24 elders may still be yet to be named. Okay, John would have saw them because he's pulled outside of time. He's now in heaven. Maybe he's seeing some of his friends that had died before. Maybe he's seeing some people that are standing here on this earth today that haven't died yet, right? That haven't haven't passed from 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 death unto life and been resurrected in in the future or outside of time, anyways. <clears throat> Perhaps that those people haven't been appointed to that position yet. But regardless, those people and if we are to be lifted up to a higher status, to a higher position of authority, to a higher position of responsibility, when we get to heaven and we hope to sit with these twenty-four elders in those 24 seats with those 24 crowns upon our head, the only way that we're going to do it is first and foremost be saved. And secondly, by maintaining good works, looking to ourselves and working in order to receive the full reward that we will eventually earn. Here, these crowns in this place that was next to the throne was given unto these guys. It's a special place for them. And they're lifted up a little bit. It's got to be something that is special because in verse 5 it says, and these guys have to be someone who is, who is special because it says in verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass likened unto crystal in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. It's a terrible place. It's a fearful place. It's, it's an awe-inspiring place to be next to the throne of God in this position. And yet these men seem perfectly comfortable. These elders seem perfectly comfortable to sit there. And it's because it's an appointed place for them. They're not here falling on their face in fear. They're, they're not here terrified at the noise and at the crashes and at the power before God. But rather, they're seeing here themselves very, very comfortable to be there. And we too can be in that same position one day if we will believe on God and then be careful to maintain good works. We'll find out later these same elders will take those crowns and cast them before God and they'll fall at their face. And this is something that they constantly do in worship and respect for Him. But here they stand before God and it's by appointment of God and it's by the purpose of God that they would be in that place of preeminence. The one thing that we can just learn from this is that, hey, God has a prepared place for you. He's already set out the seat. He's already prepared the mansion. He's already got everything there in heaven. Heaven, you'll receive it by faith, but perhaps there is more to receive if we should just
be maintaining good works, if we should seek after that full reward by working, by, by rotting in those things, by, by, by not losing those things which we have wrought, the things that we have worked for, by, by maintaining a, a good position before God, constantly monitoring your heart, making sure it's tender, making sure you're doing right to Him and before Him, and then you too can have an appointed seat, an appointed house, and an appointed place before the throne room of God, because that's what He has offered unto those that would believe and trust and follow after Him.